Um, yeah, thank you so much uh, to the organizers for inviting me to speak to you all today. I'm, I'm going to talk um, about PHP and its history over the past quarter century. Uh, but if you've ever seen the talk that I've given before, you know I'm going to do it in a very roundabout way. Uh, before I get started, though, if you don't know me, my name is Samantha Quinones, and I've been around the PHP community for a really long time, for a lot of years, um, as a, a member of the, the, the FIG, and uh, also on Twitter, where I post a lot of really dumb jokes about Star Trek, uh, and from community talks, where I talk a lot about computing history, which is part of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I am not a professional programmer anymore. It's been uh, it's been three years since I wrote um, any code for money and really five years since I did it on a regular basis. These days, uh, I still write code, but it's it's kind of for my own uh, my own gratification. Uh, I've spent the last couple of years working on uh, what I call an AI art project, which is essentially just a, a chat bot that makes memes, but it's a, a real big departure from the kind of work that I used to do. Uh, but I was a professional programmer for 20 years, and I still work with programmers. I manage them now, but it's since I became a hobbyist again that I really gained the perspective that I kind of needed to give this talk. So I'm going to talk to you about how and why PHP came to dominate web development and why it still drives so much of the content on the web and how it is, in my opinion, a, a programming language that best embraces the concept of pragmatic optimism. So to understand where PHP came from, we have to talk about the history of computers. To start with, to understand the history of computers, we have to talk about math. And I promise I'll start with something really simple. Um, it's easy when we look at the most basic algebraic expression that what we're doing is counting. And in fact, all elementary algebra can be thought of as counting. Addition is counting. Subtraction is counting backwards. Multiplication is counting groups of numbers that you've already counted, right? Division is doing that, but backwards. Even when we get to more advanced um, expressions and exponents and logarithms, it's all just fancy counting. I want to take a moment to recommend a video for you. If you're interested in this idea, it's by a mathematician and artist named Byheart, and it was what really opened my eyes to thinking about algebra in this way and help me connect with what is really happening inside the computer. Um, because after all, a modern computer is just a machine that's designed to count very, very quickly. So with that in mind, I wanna start our story in France in the year 1642, where a 19-year-old Blaise Pascal was faced with helping his father, the tax collector for the city of Rouen, uh, calculating the taxes owed and paid for this entire large city was exhausting work. If you can imagine managing the, tar the taxes for a large city with nothing but quill pens and ledger books, uh, Pascal would eventually go on to become one of the most influential mathematicians in history. And in fact, uh, he has a couple of programming languages named for him. But at this moment, 1642, he was an overworked teenager with an interesting idea. He didn't have Vihart's YouTube videos, but thankfully he was uh, much smarter than me and already understood intrinsically that arithmetic can be expressed through counting. And so he set about building a machine that could do arithmetic. It took three years of tinkering and about 50 prototypes, but eventually he received a royal patent for his design and built around 20 of the machines total. And there are about eight or nine of them that still exist. They're called Pascalines. Um, and you can see a picture of one on the screen. Uh, this is a mechanical computer uh, that can add numbers and uh, by rotating drums and uh, using weighted levers to do carries. It's actually very hard to, um, to describe how this machine works. Um, but if you want to envision this, I really recommend checking out um, a page um, uh, uh, by Nico71 uh, who built a working Pascaline out of Lego Technic bricks. It's very, very cool. He can do math on it. Uh, it's a really interesting video and really um, helps to illustrate exactly how complex this machine works. You can even see on the screen all of these tiny little gears and, uh, and, and flyweights and, and, and levers. Half a century after Blaise Pascal, uh, a fellow named Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, you see on the screen, uh, who's a philosopher and a mathematician, encountered an ancient Chinese book called the I Ching. And Leibniz had spent a lot of his academic career studying the concept of symbolic thought. 
um, which was he very uh, much put at the the crossroads between philosophy and math and math. And the, uh, this is the idea that logic um, can be broken down into computations. Early in his life, he had uh, done a lot of work to document and refine uh, the base two number system, the binary system. He did uh, develop or discover it, but he did a lot of work to uh, help uh, mathematicians understand it. And later in his life, he would also develop mechanical calculators. Um, although these were very different in design uh, and they were capable of all of the elementary arithmetic, arithmetic operations, not just addition. Uh, he also designed theoretical machines uh, that were never built, but that were capable of even more complex math, uh, including one that could do integrations, which he called the calculus racinator, which I think is an amazing name. Uh, Leibniz had laid a good deal of the groundwork that Ada Lovelace and Charles, Charles Babbage would expand on in the following century. So Babbage was a mathematician and engineer. He spent a lot of his career theorizing and then later building mechanical computers. Uh, he had developed a prototype uh, difference engine that was also capable of any arithmetic function, but it was specifically designed to compute polynomials. So you can kind of see this progression uh, of arithmetic from counting to basic algebra to, um, to, to computing polynomials, right? So he followed this work with a more theoretical design, which was actually never built, um, but he called it the analytical engine. And this was the first uh, design for a general purpose computer. When I say general purpose computer, I mean a computer that is ex capable of executing programs, right? It's not purpose built to do one thing, but it can theoretically run any program. So, you know, Alan Turing wouldn't be born for another 80 years, uh, but the concept of, of a language being, a machine being Turing complete applies. And the analytical, analytical engine that uh, Babbage designed, uh, had he ever built it, would be Turing complete. Now, Ada Lovelace was um, a contemporary mathematician at the same time. She and Babbage had corresponded for many, many years. And in 1842, she was hired to translate a lecture that Charles Babbage had given on the analytical engine, which had only been transcribed in French. And she was hired to, tra to translate it to English. And along with her English translation, she included a number of notes and appendices. and. Uh, among these, the 13th one was an algorithm for computing Bernoulli's numbers using the difference engine, or the analytical engine rather. A and this was the first, so far as we know, exam an example of an algorithm that was designed for execution on a particular piece of general purpose computing hardware, which is a very long and roundabout way of saying it was software. It was the first piece of software ever written as far as we know. The last piece of the puzzle that we need to put together is computing theory. So there were tons of people who made huge contributions to this um, throughout the early part of the 20th century. Herman Hollerith, who developed the punch card tabulator. Uh, he went on to found IBM. Howard Aiken, who designed the Harvard Mark I, which is one of the, the first practical electronic computers. And it's the computer on which uh, Grace Hopper uh, would develop the A0 code linker, which was um, was not itself a compiler, but led directly to her later innovation of, uh, of a compiler. Um, Conrad Zeus and John von Neumann uh, both collaborated with and were inspired by the next person I'm gonna talk about to develop kind of higher level models of computation, ways of thinking about computation that now we're, we're not limited to mathematical uh, computations. So, I'm focusing on Alan Turing because I want to stay focused on this idea of pragmatism, this idea of uh, focusing on real world work. And uh, the kind of nexus of theory and practice is really what defined a lot of Turing's career. As brilliant of a theoretician and mathematician as he was, uh, he was also an amazing engineer. And uh, a lot of his career was spent building practical machines that did real world work. A lot of his work was kept secret until uh, only the last recent uh, years uh, because he was engaged in uh, work for the British government. Early on, he was breaking codes for, um, for the British government in the Second World War. And his work on breaking what was called the German Naval Enigma, which was a very complex mechanical cryptography tool, uh, which had allowed the German Navy to coordinate their fleet uh, without uh, the allies being able to understand um, the, the transmissions applied 
um, his work applied cryptanalysis and mechanical engineering. So, you know, again, that nexus of theory and, and engineering to eliminate a very important advantage that the Germans had early on in the war. After the war, Turing's work turned to a more general purpose computing applications. He worked on a machine called the automatic computing engine. Um, he would later develop software and a programming manual for a machine called the Manchester Mark I, which was um, an experimental computer in the UK. Uh, and this early work on human computer interaction, which is uh, not a term that, that would come into play for another you know, 10 or 20 years, um, led him to theorize about artificial intelligence and what he termed thinking machines. And that would inspire later generations of computer scientists and, and you know, some of the folks who are, are with us today, maybe you. So stepping back a few years to when the war was still going on, um, the Americans were also developing electronic computing technology. Sadly, a lot of this period of computing history is tied up with war. Um, and the United States goal was to make the calculation of ballistic tables more efficient. So if you think about the large guns that are used in war, um, you know, it's important to understand at what angle the gun needs to be um, placed at to reach a target at a certain different distance given different conditions. And this was done by count computing ballistic uh, tables. And these were computed by human beings by hand. In fact, at this point in history, the, the word computer uh, referred to a human being, usually uh, young women who were recently graduated uh, from college with math degrees, and they would um, sit there hour by hour doing these tedious computations to develop these um, ballistic tables. The result of this uh, research and work that the American government was doing was the ENIAC, which you can see a, a part of the ENIAC. This is a, a truly a gigantic machine that filled up a building. Um, but you can see one of the, the front switch panels that was used to program the machine. Um, the electronic numerical integrator and calculator didn't actually enter service until after the war was over, um, although it did play a part in um, in uh, doing modeling for the development of the you know, thermonuclear, thermonuclear and hydrogen uh, atomic bombs. Um, but the hardware, like I said, was it was a massive expansion in the kind of scope and complexity from all of these earlier electromagnetic uh, mechanical computers that I was talking about. And um, while it was a remarkable piece of, of hardware, I want to focus in on the software. So several of the women who had worked as human computers were engaged to program the ENIAC. And, and at this point, computer programs were sequential algorithms, right? Remember, this machine was designed to, to compute these uh, very kind of specific calculus um, uh, functions. And there was no standardized concept for things like branching and flow control in a program. So these six women, uh, Betty Jean Bardick, Betty Holberton, uh, Marilyn Meltzer, Kay McNulty, Ruth Teitelbaum, uh, and Frances Spence were left to create the discipline of computer programming. They were given a machine uh, and had to invent concepts that we take for granted, um, like using a breakpoint for debugging code or using if then else flow control patterns. Right? These are all inventions um, of this group and their colleagues. Later, Bardic would actually be tasked with forming a team to convert the ENIAC from um, to, to a stored program computer. When I say that the, the ENIAC was originally programmed by physically rewiring it. Um, and a stored computer program, which is the kind of computers that we have now, uh, store all of their code uh, you know, on the tape or a disk uh, or punched cards and then can run that program uh, from start to finish, and then you can just load another program in, right? You didn't have to rewire the computer for each program. Um, so they really pioneered the framework of software, what we would recognize as a modern computer program. My last media recommendation here is a, a great film uh, that unfortunately is not available for free, but can be rented for a fairly low price. It's a documentary called The Computers. Um, and it was produced by John Palferman and Kathy Kleiman, Kathy Kleiman and is directed by Kate McMahon. And this film explores the work of these women and their colleagues. And, you know, all of us are, who are programmers today owe a huge debt for them uh, to them for creating our craft. And I think it's really fascinating to see where uh, kind of the very earliest signs of what would become our industry uh, started. 
So moving forward and starting in the 1950s, we start to see this proliferation of modern high-level programming languages. So remember to this point, programming and formal mathematics and electrical engineering are completely entwined, right? To program a computer without a solid grasp of those other disciplines was really almost impossible. The people programming these computers were, uh, were mathematicians. High-level languages on the other, uh, in, uh, on the opposite side, were designed to be accessible to people without a deep understanding of how the computer worked internally. Essentially, to allow people to write programs in a language that more closely matched the way humans communicate with one another. So, in the early 1950s, Grace Hopper, who I mentioned before, um, she'd done this pioneering work on the A0 uh, linker for the Harvard Mark I. She published a paper on code compilation, so this concept of uh, taking a high-level language and then turning it into machine instructions, and actually built a working compiler for translating mathematical notation into uh, machine instructions, and then later a compiler for a language called Flowmatic. Uh, and this work on these early compilers would influence the development of the COBOL language. At the same time, John Backus uh, was working at IBM on a project to improve uh, the experience of programming the IBM 701 computer. This was one of the early uh, commercial computers or, or you know, mass-produced computers. And the result of this work was the first version of the Fortran language. These two efforts represent really in a really important branch in computer science history. These early languages, Fortran and COBOL, which by the way are still in use today, 70 years later, are the ancestors of almost all modern programming languages. So if we look at this little bit of Fortran code, which just implements FizzBuzz, uh, we see that a program that is completely familiar to us. We see a lot of the early elements of syntax that would be inherited by later, later languages. We see statements. Those statements are terminated by punctuation. We have comments, we have code that is structured into blocks, if then else logical structures, do loops. If we jump forward 10 years, we start to see languages like Algol, uh, which has functional syntax and ways of passing and returning data uh, that seem very familiar to us today. And going another 10 years into the future, we finally saw a language that probably seems familiar to most of us, C, right? So the PHP interpreter itself is implemented in C. And so if you ever looked at internals, you've seen it. And if you look at the syntax, it's very clearly similar to PHP. And there's a very good reason for that, which I will come back to. But first, I want to jump back over um, to the other branch and talk about COBOL. Uh, I wouldn't consider COBOL to be a direct ancestor of PHP, but they do have very similar stories. So COBOL grew out of a meeting that was organized in 1959 um, by an engineer named Mary Hawes from the Burroughs Corporation and included a lot of uh, industry folks, military folks, including Grace Hopper. And the idea here was to create a language that resembled English and would allow non-mathematicians to create programs to execute business logic. And that's the important word, business logic. We still use it today. Um, COBOL put programming into the hands of people who were less interested in the computer itself, the hardware, but rather applications, right? Software developers who could ignore the hardware and could in fact write one set of source code that could theoretically be compiled and run on many different types of hardware, although that didn't become you know, simple for, for quite a while. Um, COBOL allowed for the creation of the programmer analyst Right, someone who approached business problems using computer technology as a tool, as a means to an end. And that's not a title that gets used very much anymore, although it still exists in the mainframe world. I was a programmer analyst early in my career. Uh, but I think it really does describe the kind of work that a lot of us still do to this day. If you remember the before time in the long, long ago when we used to travel on airplanes, you know, COBOL is the heart of that experience. COBOL. Um, calculates the routes and the logistics, it manages ticketing, it drives the terminals that gate agents use to assist passengers. You know, without these systems, modern air travel would be impossible and to replace them would be an unfathomable investment. So anytime you fly on a plane, praise COBOL. And likewise, the banking industry also adopted COBOL. Uh, COBOL manages uh, bank accounts and calculates interest. It settles transactions. It powers uh, bank teller terminals, both uh, you know the human human teller and the automated teller. So anytime you pay for something with a credit card, 
access your bank account, take uh, take cash out at an ATM, praise COBOL. COBOL, very much like PHP, was largely a victim of its own success. COBOL absolutely dominated the world of business mainframes into the into the 1970s and 80s. Um, it was accessible to lots of people. It was easy to learn, and it could be used to solve real business problems really quickly. Uh, if you needed the computer to sum up a ledger, apply a percentage-based adjustment, and settle those transactions out to accounts, COBOL would do that for you. In fact, COBOL, this is a, a, a technical detail and a tangent, you know, we have this trouble in modern languages where we want to express money and then apply percentages to it, which requires us to do floating point math. Uh, which is inaccurate. So, you know, usually we multiply by 100 to take off the decimal point, do the math, and then convert back and forth. COBOL actually had a native uh, a native type for a binary coded decimal, um, which allowed them to actually write code to do all of that work without worrying about floating point math. So, uh, you know, COBOL allowed for programmer analysts, you know, these business people with tech skills to create sophisticated applications without having to understand computing theory. They didn't need to be electrical engineers. They didn't need to be mathematicians. And when you have, you know, big quotes, amateurs writing code who are more concerned with solving an immediate problem and less, or maybe not even at all concerned with writing good code, you get spaghetti. COBOL programs were, uh, were notorious for their uh, obnoxious variable names, control flows that were impossible to follow. Uh, I know looking through old COBOL code, it was not at all uncommon for us to print out uh, source code on green bar printer paper and lay it out on the floor and uh, take string and draw lines between things to try and understand flow control. Um, you know, they had sometimes indecipherable structure. They were brittle. They broke easily. For those of you who are old enough and remember Y2K, you know, my one of my first jobs was fixing Y2K bugs um, in bank software. And, you know, like there was a lot of power behind COBOL, but it definitely let you um, shoot yourself in the foot. If this sounds familiar at all, it's very much how people used to and still do talk about PHP. The greatest weakness of PHP and of COBOL is the same thing that made them strong. Uh, it, it gets out of your way. It lets you build an application that works. Now, it may not work well. It may be impossible to maintain. It may be fundamentally insecure, but it works. And working code can always be extended. It can be approved. It can be hardened for any business that relies on computers, which I would say in, in 2021 is almost all businesses, um, working code, no matter how bad it is, is your most valuable asset. So with the 1980s, the cost of computers started to plummet, specifically mid-range, um, which are kind of like large monolithic servers and microcomputers, uh, which at the time referred more to PCs, but even now we would think of like commodity racked servers as microcomputers, which made computing available to many more businesses and uh, even hobbyists. In the 1990s, computers were starting to become a feature in the home um, and the office and in school, and there was this new paradigm of computer emerging. Uh, towards the end of 1990, Tim Berners-Lee, who was working at the CERN lab in Switzerland, had already started promoting uh, his web server and HTTP within the Institute. So in a very subtle hint of things to come, one of the things he did to goad people into using his new browser and web server was to, to use it to host the phone directory. If you could, what, could access the phone directory, via, phone directory via the web browser, you could avoid logging onto the mainframe. And you know, in 1990, logging onto a mainframe computer was not particularly simple. You either needed uh, a terminal that was directly wired uh, into the machine on your desk, or if you were using a PC, you needed a ter special terminal emulation software. You might, depending on how things were set up, require a token ring adapter. Uh, to connect to the, the coax token ring network that um, that drove the workstation, so it was it was not the most simple thing in the world. On August 6, 1991, uh, which was you know 30 years and a couple of weeks ago, Tim made his web server software, uh, CERN HTTPD, and browser available, and it created a revolution. There's very few technologies that have been embraced so quickly uh, and with so much so much excitement. Only a month later, uh, Luis Addis had uh, already ported the software to the VM CMS operating system. 
uh, which was the dominant IBM mainframe operating system at the time, and web servers started to come online at universities and research institutes. By 1994, uh, there were more than uh, 2,500 websites, and by 1995, that number had grown to more than 20,000. Some sites that would become household names like eBay and Amazon and Yahoo um, came online during this, this formative period. But it was very clear that the static early web of handwritten HTML documents was insufficient. Individuals uh, and companies were eager to create more dynamic experiences for their websites. And since the only real contract was that the client would make requests to the server using HTTP and the server would return you know, HTML, the obvious solution to the problem was to generate the HTML on the fly in response to dynamic requests. This opened up more sophisticated channels for two-way communication. Not only could a website be used to radiate information outward to clients, they could also be used to collect information from clients um, through contact forms and through guest books. And you know, I mentioned that um, you know, mainframes were still dominant and actually how I first started doing web programming was building uh, web gateways for mainframe applications. So you know, powering these new dynamic web pages wasn't simple we found ourselves kind of in that same position that I talked about before, people needing to solve real world, real life, real world problems, um, you know, like receiving contact information from a user, taking a customer's order. In my case, it was request automation. So, you know, a, a, an account executive needed to have a list of all the transactions that were on a credit card for a certain period of time. And to do that, they had to log into the mainframe and do all of this stuff. To build these kind of applications, you had to know how to program a computer. So there was this informal standard. It was started by folks at the NCSA, which is the National Center for Supercomputing Applications in the United States, um, all the way back in 1993 for what they called a gateway interface. So it was essentially a standard way of passing data into and out of a web server um, on the back end. So passing from a web server to some other program. Uh, this was later formalized under an RFC. It was um, the working, uh, working group in 1997. Uh, formalized CGI, this is uh, Rob uh, McCool and John Frakes um, and Tony Sanders and George Phillips. Um, and to put it into context, like I said, a lot of this work was being done to make data in these legacy systems, mainframes and mid-range servers and um, you know huge vertical databases, Oracle and Sybase accessible through a web browser. And this standard was designed to provide a common way of building those gateways. Generally speaking, these gateways were written in C, and the fact that RFC itself is largely specified in C. This was still a very much a programmer-focused approach to building applications. If you've ever done any non-trivial coding in C, you know that it's not approachable without understanding at least some computer science fundamentals. You have to manage memory, buffer and secure data at the program boundaries, design and construct data structures, um, and compile your programs for the hardware that you intend them to run on. The CGI Perl module was actually an early attempt to open this kind of programming up to a broader audience. So Perl is a very powerful programming language in its own right, um, but it's a lot more approachable. It has a smaller surface of pre-built data structures. It manages memory. Um, you have pre-compiled language interpreters for lots of different hardware and operating systems. And Perl was a tool that a lot of system administrators and data analysts were already very comfortable with. But still, we were in a C world, and increasingly, we were just trying to plaster an HTML interface over it. CGI, uh, whether it was written in C or in Perl or any other language, was very clunky. And then along came Rasmus Lerdorf. Sorry, that's the wrong picture. Uh, Rasmus is a programmer and a systems engineer. And during these early days of the web, he was a contributor to the Apache HTTP project. He was an early adopter of the web, particularly of creating dynamic uh, web pages, and he had been building a suite of tools to expose common functionality that you needed um, in these gateway programs to the CGI interface. He was building what he called a C API for the web. So in 1995, let's have a nice picture of Rasmus. He's actually a very nice and funny guy. Um, in 1995, he shared a first version of his personal homepage tools, which he described as a set of small binaries, CG, small CGI binaries written in C. And essentially, they allowed uh, for templating. Keep in mind, at this point, there was no talk of a programming language. PHP was a C API for the web. It was a small collection of useful CGI binaries that could perform functions that a lot of people needed to perform. There was no thought that this would become a programming language. And we'll come back to that. 
first let's look at the web at how a web application from a very perspective very basic perspective we have four principal concerns we have the operating system the web server the business logic and the data store for any dynamic web application you need to combine these four concerns together um, to solve some problem in the real world and to accomplish this um, you know we first receive a request in the form of a valid http request we then route that request at this point this is going to route either to a static html file or in the case of um, CGI, we're talking a dynamic web application, so we're going to pass control over to a program. That program is going to execute, and thanks to the CGI specification, we know exactly what data is going to be passed into the program and how. You know, we have those environment variables that have the get and post and server variables, all that kind of stuff that we, we are familiar with as web, at, web uh, programmers. And then the program executes, it produces some kind of output. Hopefully that's going to be valid HTML or at least some format that the client is expecting to receive. And then finally, the, the web server will return that output back to the client over the network packaged up as a valid HTTP response. All of this works really great when you're hosting a single application on a server. But again, requiring a server uh, and a network connection, which requires a domain name and assigned IP address, all of these um, are far out of the hands of a typical person who wants to share something about themselves or run a small a small store. So when you think about personal home pages, you know this is not really directed at people who are, uh, you know, who are creating gateways for large legacy systems in a company. It's for people who are trying to build dynamic web pages for more personal reasons. Ideally, we would want to be able to share one server among uh, share one server a bunch among a bunch of websites, it's really more efficient, right? You don't want to pay for a whole server um, that's just hosting one small website that gets, doesn't get a lot of traffic. And, and by hosting multiple servers on multiple sites on a server, it makes financial sense then uh, for the people who do own servers to just rent out little bits of it. So we, we, we see the, the development of web hosting. Here we run into a big problem though. If you're going to host web applications written in C, they will be fast. Uh, but they could have memory leaks um, because all of the websites are running under a single Apache server. Remember, this is before virtualization was a common thing, at least in the uh, microcomputer world. Uh, there was no way to make sure that one tenant didn't access data belonging to another tenant, that a crash didn't uh, cascade out of a website to other uh, tenants. We can use CGI PM, which makes it a bit easier to host many sites on a single server without having to worry about memory and crashes but Perl is relatively slow to execute and it's hard to secure. Um, and again, everything's being run by the same user. And this is where we come to PHP and what made it really different. PHP provided three key features uh, that made it for the natural choice for hosting multiple websites in a single web server. It's robust, efficient, and secure. And I know what you're thinking. That sounds exactly the opposite of what everyone thinks about PHP, but, but stick with me. Perl CGI programs were very slow. Apache had to hand everything off to the Perl interpreter, which then started, executed, returned. Mod PHP, um, in contrast, pulled PHP directly into the Apache server. For PHP, you pass control to a fork, it executes and then terminates. There is no shared memory, there is no stored state, it is a perfect sandbox. Uh, eventually, a similar Apache mod for Perl would be released, but even then, you can see how the philosophical difference between PHP and something like Perl, remember Perl is trying to be um, a broad spectrum programming language, whereas PHP is being very pragmatic about solving one problem and then the next and the next. PHP implemented just enough of the Apache mod interface to handle HTTP requests. Remember, it's not a programming language at this point. It's a tool to expose C APIs to the web. So mod PHP sites were much safer and easier to keep secure because it was simpler. It's efficient because PHP only needed to be handed over to this fork. Apache didn't wait, need to wait for an entire interpreter to spin up for each request. This allowed you to run more sites, serve them without requiring additional CPUs. And then uh, PHP was simply more secure. Again, everything is running on the same server under the same user. A memory leak or infinite loop could crash the whole thing. PHP avoids this in a very pragmatic way by setting an upper memory limit, right? If a program hits that limit, it gets killed um, in the same approach uh, of having an execution time limit. If you have a runaway loop, uh, PHP will just die. Uh, you know, it crashes the, the individual application, but it protects the server. 
Even safe mode, which is kind of one of those things that PHP has never been able to live down, played a really key role here with everything running under the same system user, locking down access to system resources was incredibly difficult. And I won't argue that safe mode was a good solution, but it was a solution. So, you know, the hate on safe mode in the context that it was created is to kind of make fun of someone for blocking a door with a chair um, when the door doesn't have a lock. You know, safe mode allowed shared hosts to have some security against malicious code. It wasn't great, but it was certainly better than nothing. I want to offer you a hot take here. PHP was never a bad programming language. At first, it wasn't even a programming language. But even when it started evolving in that direction, it wasn't bad. I want to walk through some of the most derided features of PHP and try to understand them in the context of the time they existed. So one of the things that people coming to PHP from other languages always point out is that PHP handles globals in a really weird way. And it does. You have this global statement where you explicitly mark a variable as a global, or you can put them in this special array um, that, you know, dollar globals, which looks exactly like all of those CGI data arrays. And, you know, it's complex. It's, it's, it's strange, right? In most languages, um, you know, your variable scope is a matter of where the variable is declared, which is great. And it makes sense to almost everyone who's used to programming. But if you've ever been in the position of trying to find a global variable collision in a large and complex code base, it's kind of a nightmare. And this was a very pragmatic way, explicit global direction um, declarations. It's a very pragmatic, pragmatic way to avoid accidentally defining a variable as global, right? So again, it's a, a pragmatic solution to a problem that may go against the grain of what is good or, or typical programming, um, but lets people get stuff done. And what about register globals? Speaking about, about globals, this is another area where PHP's origins as a symbol and approaching approachable templating system rather than a, a right programming language comes into play. If you have a field on your web page called name, you have a variable in your script called name. You know, it's, it's hard of us, uh, hard for some of us who are programmers to really understand this. But for non-programmers, the, the two hardest hurdles to get over uh, when learning to program are, are scope and assignment. Right? So if you're building a set of tools, to simplify creating dynamic web pages. This really just makes sense. And you know, again, these were de this was deprecated uh, uh, ten years ago. So I don't know why we still talk about them. But when these were introduced, the web was a very different place. You know, JavaScript. Um, JavaScript was created the same year as PHP, but it was not much used until Firefox came out in 2004. And even then, it was a couple more years before it started being a really uh, common thing on the web. In the early days of PHP, there really was no cross-site scripting to worry about. So it was a less of a gamble uh, than it would eventually become. Okay, magic quotes were never a good idea. They probably did more to cement bad practices and new programmers uh, than they ever did to prevent SQL injection. Um, but uh, you know, again, they were a pragmatic solution, a naive one to be sure, but a pragmatic solution to a real problem that the audience for PHP, more amateur programmers, um, would probably have ignored no matter what. And it probably did save uh, some sites from SQL injection at the, the cost of uh, embedding some pretty bad practices in folks that we had to uh, educate them out of later. Well, let's talk about types in PHP. Um, I, I get heated about this. There's nothing inconsistent about PHP type, PHP's type system. It makes complete sense. It is well documented in the manual. You know, part of becoming proficient with a language is learning the types. With a strictly typed system, you have to learn lots of specific types. Uh, and with a weekly type system, you have to learn its type conversion table. If you can be expected to remember the difference between all of the C types and the aliases, um, you can remember how strings are cast to numbers, uh, or you can look it up in in the manual. Right? It's it's completely consistent. If you, I'm not, I'm talking to the choir, but um, you know, experienced programmers can look at uh, like these statements that I have here on the left, and you understand why they work the way that they work. Haters don't get this one. P PHP types are completely fine. They're they're fine. They're they're totally fine. Um, let's move on. F function names are not case sensitive, and probably they should be. But again, let's talk about context. PHP was used for templating, and we had not yet standard on standardized on lowercase for HTML. So it made a lot of sense 
uh, for people to be able to use the same standard for PHP as the HTML that it was embedded in. By the time there was really a standard in place, changing this would have been a compatibility nightmare. It would have broken uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of websites. And so now we're kind of stuck with it. You know, use PHP CS, enforce a code standard. It's fine. People say that naming should be consistent and sure, okay. Show me a language where that's the case. I've been doing this for 25 years. I've written production code in more than two dozen languages and I'm not buying it. Uh, what people actually mean is that naming should be consistent horizontally across the surface of a language's standard library. And sure, if you look at PHP without knowing better, the function signatures are kind of all over the place. The, the thing is PHP doesn't have a standard library. I mean, it, it does kind of, but it, it didn't originally. And if you remember all the way back to 1995, PHP wasn't originally meant to be a language. It was meant to be a C API for the web. Now get ready, I'm gonna blow your mind unless you already knew this. Uh, the functions are just thin wrappers of the underlying C libraries. The string functions in libc were haystack needle. So, the, so PHP is haystack needle. The array functions were needle haystack. So the array functions in PHP are, are needle haystack. They're all perfectly consistent vertically down to the libraries that they're wrapping. And that goes across to the OCI 8 libraries for uh, accessing Oracle, the MySQL libraries. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're doing. I, PHP was just wrapping these C libraries in the early day. What I wanna get to is this question of who PHP is for. And the web that PHP was born into was a very different place from today. You know, a company might have a website, but we were still years away from companies that are websites. Uh, today, we are building more and more complex applications on top of the web, and that requires more and more complex languages. We see this in how PHP has evolved and continues to evolve over the years, and also in the evolution of JavaScript, right? So both of these languages are having to mature as the demands we place on them get bigger and more complex. But in 1995, the web was a vehicle for uh, for expression, you know, to share art, to share research, to share resources on a a legacy computer to share information with the community. Um, it was used a lot by small businesses just to, to create a presence. PHP was a custom fit for the shared host of the 1990s. That's why WordPress and Drupal were written, written in PHP and not in C. It's why they continue to dominate the web even today in 2021. Um, Two out of every websites on the planet are WordPress sites. If you only count sites that are driven by some kind of CMS is three out of five. It's no coincidence that the same people who hate WordPress um, hate PHP and vice versa. I, I won't pretend that they aren't rough tools, but they can be used to create incredible things or to hack something together that's good enough to solve a problem for the moment. PHP didn't start out as a programming language. Rasmus in 1995 would have looked at you cross-eyed if you suggested such a thing. He probably would still look at you cross-eyed if you suggested it now. Uh, PHP became a programming language as the people who were using it to solve problems found themselves evolving ever more complex ones. The problems evolved and so the tool had to evolve. If you think about where we started in 1995, a set of CGI binaries, process forms, no real math functions, you couldn't write loops. It wasn't until the second major version that we had a set of, of basic complete flow control tools um, for version three, Zev and Andy stepped in, created a real parser. We start to see something evolving into a simple programming language. Um, PHP 4 came with a brand new engine. I think this is the point where you can really consider PHP to be a programming language. Uh, eventually, you didn't even need to execute it from inside of a web request. Uh, at nine years old, we start to see PHP take the shape it would eventually take. It was, if PHP was the childhood phase and PHP 4 was the awkward teen years, you know, PHP 5 is when the show moves to college, right? PHP drives a cool car, wears a denim jacket, smokes cigarettes, right? PHP was something new. A year later, PHP finally got an abstraction layer over a lot of those C database libraries that were available. I mentioned OCI 8. Um, for accessing Oracle, there were libraries for Sybase and Informix, and um, you know they, they were a mess. And if you were trying to move from one database to another, um, your mind would crumple up inside of your skull uh, and hurt you. Um, and having something like PDO really uh, was an advancement for the language. 
we started to move past simple websites. JavaScript is becoming a real player. PHP uh, APIs rather are needed to handle asynchronous requests. Now we're 15, 15 years into its life. PHP was on the verge of a whole new evolution, right? PHP 6 was going to have real namespaces, closures, uh, better, better garbage collection, late static binding, Unicode support. Um, that last part didn't work out so well, but all of that other cool stuff became PHP 3. And then a few years later, PHP 5.4, which I personally consider the first good version, um, finally got rid of lots of ancient cruft, like uh, register global, safe mode, you know, things that people are still talking about that have been gone now for almost 10 years. 5.5, we start to see influence from languages like Python. We get big uh, performance improvements. The opcode caching and the Zen, Zen uh, optimizer go, go native. Uh, 5.6 continues to refine the type system. And then version 7 drops, which is built on a new engine. This is uh, a new version, much, much faster, better improvements to the type system, more performant. It has a real AST, which unlocks um, better developer tooling, you know, like uh, static analyzers. If you use um, PHP Song, PHP Stand, um, these were made possible by the improvements that came in version 7. And then each minor version in the 7.0 lineage added more and more improvements to the type system, more compiler optimizations improvements to the op cache, all of which continue into the current generation. So if you think about, think that PHP in 25 years, 26 years, went from a thin wrapper over libc functions to a programming language and a runtime with a just-in-time compiler, and in a few months, version 8.1 will bring fibers, a form of threading, right? That was one of the things that people say about PHP. It's bad language. You can't do threading, right? Um, talk about coming full circle. Talk about an evolution, right? PHP is the ultimate programming language glow up. Telling a story like this, um, one that spans more than a quarter century, is difficult. Today, we have, have and will hear, hear from brilliant people. We're going to learn about uh, technical details of where PHP is and where it's going, how to optimize code in our teams and ourselves. Um, but PH, just like PHP has come a long way from being a simple little tool, we have come a long way from building simple little websites. Tools are very funny things. Often they are not beautiful things. Uh, form will always be more important than function when you're creating a tool. A lot of time it's hard to even figure out what the function is. But as craftspeople, uh, we grow with our tools and they grow with us. At first we fight with them, but in time they almost become extensions of us. The, the simple bronze and iron tools of a sixth century mason don't really look like much, right? There's probably a version of, a better version of each and every one of these tools on screen. Uh, even in the sixth century, there were probably better versions of each and every one of these tools. Today there certainly are, but simple tools like this can be used to build wonders that stand for millennia in the right hands. PHP isn't good or bad. It's a tool. It's a useful one. Sure. Uh, looking at PHP 8, we might even say that it's a sharply honed and beautiful tool in its own right, but it's never the tool that matters. Even the simplest tools can be used to build amazing things. The last year and a half have been difficult. It's still difficult. Um, you know, we're, we're not able to be together. Um, and, you know, COVID is still surging across the whole planet. And we've, we've all lost um, so much and so many people since the start of 2020. But it's a gift to be together today, even digitally. During the pandemic, I know I've personally learned, again, how important community is. What really gives me hope and makes me excited for the future is the potential for all that we can build together. We have massive challenges ahead of us. And increasingly, as engineers and technologists, we're being called on to use our skills to build some kind of future, or at least to help. Technology has incredible power. And the impact that our work can have uh, for good or evil is profound. It, it's a time for us to consider what we're building and what it means for ourselves and for our communities and for our families uh, and for the folks that are going to come after us. I, I want you to take from this example of what something like the PHP community is capable of. PHP 
you know, I've talked about Rasmus and Zev and Andy, but there are uh, thousands of people who have contributed to the language and the ecosystem over the last 26 years. Um, PHP was created um, not by one or three people, but by by these thousands, you know, the hundreds of people who have committed to PHP, uh, so the PHP interpreter itself, people who have documented it, written tutorials, written uh, reams and volumes of open source software, the entire ecosystem that surrounds it um, and lets us solve these big problems. It's, it's community that does that. Community is powerful. Um, together we can solve big problems. Um, we can stay focused on the next task, the next improvement, make it a little bit better, make it a little bit stronger, make it a little bit more secure. Optimism is not naive. As long as we stay focused on the next task, right, the next contribution. So today is a day for community. It's a day to come together and learn. Opportunities like this, like I said, are a gift, especially um, in times like this, which which can sometimes feel very very dark. And I hope that it leaves you feeling ready to tackle those big problems because we have got a lot of work left to do. Thank you so much for your time.